Okay. It's on page 565 if you have a Ryrie study Bible. If you don't, go to 1 Kings and turn right. And you'll run right into it. Ready to roll? All right. Verse 8, 2 Kings 4, 8. Came to, it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman. And the word great means important or significant. This is very rare in Oriental culture that this description be used of a woman. But it was in this particular instance. And she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. So it turned into a restaurant, bus stop kind of a thing for Elisha. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make us a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. Let us set for him there a bed, a table, a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be, when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber, and lay there. And he said to Gehazi his servant, Call the Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said unto her, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? What can I do for you, ma'am? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king? You know, I know the king. So he's dropping some names here, and the woman is not interested. How about to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. I don't, I don't need to know the people you know. He said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season... According to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, or no, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, According to the time of life. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. So he had, a, he had a heat stroke. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. This kid was about four to five years old. Well, near the present day ruins of Jezreel, in the valley of Esdralon, there is a little village. We've got our map. Uh, this, this city actually is still in existence today. And it's called Sulem. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this or not. Uh, see the Sea of Galilee? Top right. All right, come to the middle of the map and drop straight down. And the last white dot you see in the middle Shulam or Shunem right there is this city that we're talking about. It's an Arab city today. And just recently, uh, some Jews have moved into the area, but it is a, a vast majority of these citizens are uh, Arabs today. It's nine miles south of Nazareth. This is the hometown of Christ. And uh, again, I think the current population is around 2,545. Uh, this was as of uh, 2017. And in this little city, okay, thank you, Anna. Uh, in this little place, some 2,500 years ago, there was a very great woman. She was uh, probably wealthy. She was a very important, significant figure in this town. Uh, she was very prominent, a woman of high standing. Again, this is very rare in Mediterranean culture for a woman to be pointed out like this. But it seems as though that the woman was the chief partner in the marriage. The husband, we don't even, we're not given any details about him at all other than he knows how to mud up a wall and build a little extra room on the house. And, and here's the story. There was a preacher by the name of Elisha. When he came through on his circuit, he stopped here one day. And as uh, Middle Eastern hospitality 
it goes, and they are very hospitable people over there, uh, you were obligated to open your door and to let people come in and eat and take care of them so they could go on the way because there was no such thing as a hotel or a motel or anything like that, a truck stop. Camel stops weren't uh, thought of at this point. And so, uh, of course, anytime where there's food, there are preachers, kind of like love bugs, are attracted to water with uh, baby oil in it. And so as oft as he did this, so it got to be a pretty regular thing that Elisha would stop here and he'd eat a meal with them and, and visit with them a little bit. And finally one day the woman says to the husband, you know what we ought to do? We ought to build a little room on the house. And that way when he comes, he and his assistant, they can stay in the room. And so uh, the husband does that. He bakes him some mud bricks and he builds a little wall and he outfits this thing with, uh, well, there's a bed, there's a table, there's a stool, and a candlestick, all right? So bare necessities. And so the next time Elisha and Gehazi come by, they, uh, they eat their meal, and the woman says, oh, by the way, uh, we have a place for you to stay. Now, any time you come down, you can just stay here, you can eat, and just make this your home away from home. Well, they were, they were excited and grateful for that. And so they're in the room, and the, uh, the woman is called to the door. And Elisha says, you know, you've been very kind to us, and we appreciate your hospitality. What, what can I do for you? How about I drop in a good word to the king? I know the king. Uh, how about the captain of the host, which was like the, the general Schwarzkopf of the day? He was the top military leader and she was like no no I'm fine here uh, I live among my own people and I don't I don't need that and so it was Gehazi the assistant that was sensitive enough and observant enough to notice she doesn't have any children there are no toys in the yard and no toys in the you know there, there are no broken lamps laying around the uh, the floor and so he says she doesn't have any kids and Elisha like you're right she doesn't have any children. And so we've got uh, this woman now. She's called to the door. And Elisha says, uh, this time, next year, you're going to have a child. Well, apparently he touches a nerve. And she says, no, uh, don't, don't play with this. The husband is old. And so apparently she's disappointed in life that she has no children. And so this was the one thing that you just, you didn't touch this particular area of her life. And so he said, no, I'm not, I'm not lying. You will have a child this time next year. And guess what? She did. Well, it's several years later now after this initial event. The kid is anywhere from four to five years old. Just a young, young child. And he wanted to go out in the field with his daddy one day wanted to go to work it was take your four-year-old to work with you day and so the kid gets on the donkey and they go trotting out to the field in the Jezreel Valley beautiful beautiful area of Israel and um, while they're out there it, the sun comes up and it is a brutally hot day brutally hot and after a while this four or five-year-old kid develops a severe headache and the son has just taken a vengeful toll on this child, and he doesn't feel good. And I think it is intriguing that dad says in verse number 19, not that, don't take him to the doctor, don't take him to the hospital, take him to his mother. What better place for a child to be than with his mother? And so they take this boy, unnamed, we have no clue what his name was. He's sitting on his mother's lap, probably actually laying in his mother's arms. Sweat pouring off his little head. His head is splitting with a headache. And the Bible says at the, at the strike of noon, the boy dies. Well, that's, that's quite a tragedy. But I, I think it is significant that this uh, young man was taken to his mom. And uh, we've, got, we've got folks in here, you've still got your moms. 
and that's a that's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing to be able to go to mom. Uh, you mothers have what psychologists call the nesting instinct. Men don't have this. You do. You have the capacity to make wherever you are a comfortable place, a nest, a home. It's just a contemporary word. You moms know how to make just a house. I'm talking about drywall and block and carpet. You, you turn that building into a home. I, I'm, I'm amazed with, with these baby showers. That ladies are usually, and thank God, they're in charge of this. And, of course, you've got to have decorations. And, and you've got to have the right tablecloth. And you've got to have the right stuff on the wall. And you've got to have the right decor on the tables what if guys were in charge of baby showers yeah thank you exactly uh yeah we're gonna meet down in maters we'll be in that back room back yonder and uh, y'all come on uh, we we don't make a home you ladies make a home and uh, so this this young man is uh critically ill there's no medicine there 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 are no medical professionals in the area and so he, he sits on mom's lap and she prays for him and then at noon he dies well let's look now at verse number 20 when he had taken him and brought him to his mother he sat on her knees till noon and then died she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God now do you think there's a little symbolism right there this is the guy that promised I told him not to lie to me I told him not to fool with me I told him not to joke with me but now this my heart has been poured into this child and now he's dead so she put him on his bed and shut the door upon him and went out and she said unto her husband and said called unto her husband and said send me I pray thee one of the young men and one of the asses that I may run to the man of God and come again. Now, what do you think she wants to say? What kind of message do you think this Shunammite woman has for the man that promised her a son that has been struck down at four to five years old? And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? Her husband is asking. Is it the new moon? Is it the Sabbath? Is, you know what? She said, No, it, it's, it's well. Everything's okay. She saddled her ass and said to her servant, drive and go forward, slack not. In other words, hit the accelerator and let's get out of Dodge. We've got we to gotta get there in a hurry. So she went, came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite woman. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered as well. And she came to the man of God to the hill. And she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. And the man of God said, let her alone for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord had hid it from me and hadn't told me anything about it. And then she says in verse 28, did I desire a son of my Lord? You remember the day that I stood in your doorway and you asked me, what do you want? Did I say, I want a son? Was that my idea? It was not. Did not I say, do not deceive me? You remember me saying that to you? Then he said to Gehazi, gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way. And if thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay thy staff upon the face of the child. So Elisha is very well aware that this woman is upset. Very well. He can feel the heat off of her. And so he sends his associate, sends his assistant. What I want you to do is go lay your staff on this child. So verse number uh, 30, the mother of the child said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. I'm not leaving until you come. I'm not talking, I don't want Gehazi. I want you to come. And he rose and followed her. Gehazi got there before them 
and he's laid his staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. He went again to meet them. He ran way ahead of them, and he comes back and says, I did what you told me to do. Nothing happened. And when Elisha came into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. Then a really odd thing happens. He goes in, verse 33, and there was just the two of them. And verse number 34 says that he laid on the child, put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. He stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, and went up and stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times. He opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was coming to him, he said, take up thy son. She went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. When I read this story, um, I'm, I'm struck by, first of all, the order, take this child to his mother. And I think that is when a, when a child's fate is wounded. I think the best place for him to go is to the feet of a godly mother. Now, keep this in mind. Not every mother, I don't think, is qualified to be the kind of mom that this Shunammite woman was. There are a lot of, how can I say, there are, there are a lot of women in the world that have children that are not moms. There are a lot of women in the world that have children, not for the purpose of wanting a child. She want, This was the desire of her heart. Not every mother is that way. Not every, every mother gives birth because that's what she wanted. But in this case, this is exactly what this woman wanted. And so she has, she's had this child. She has poured herself into this child. And let me, let me say, if you had a mother that was a godly Christian woman, you can thank God today that that was a blessing that you had. I'm not saying that because it's Mother's Day. I'm telling you that you mothers have a greater influence on the direction of your children than any other human being in the world if you are a godly mother. That's what God has put in you. Now, some 880 years later, in a village called Nain, which was just like that far from Shunem, just around the shoulder of the hill, uh, Mount Tabor as a matter of fact, Jesus would stop a funeral procession in this same area. And there was a little boy in the casket. And he would lay his hands on this sarcophagus, this casket, and he would say this, young man, arise. And the Bible tells us that he sat up and was delivered to his mother. Something like that happened 880 years previous to that event. And it seems as though that the miracle of the Shunammite woman was sort of a prophecy of what would happen there nearly a thousand years later. What better, honestly, what better counsel than to take him to his mom? Now we've got a lot of us in here today. Your mom is not here with you anymore. Your mom is in heaven. And I don't know how long ago she died, but I do know this, that probably the most influential person in your life was your mother. And this, this world will make war on the faith of these kids right here. So they're still in elementary school, junior high, they'll be in high school before long, and then after that, they're going to go to college somewhere. And I can almost guarantee you, depending on the college they go to naturally, but if they go to a state school or government school, your faith is going to be attacked. Now, we've still got them here. They're still in church. They're still in junior church. They're still living at home. Uh, these kids need to be taught something other than games and sports and they need to be taught something more significant nothing wrong with those issues I'm just saying while you have them 
within the bounds of your home, strengthen their faith. And the way you do that is to have a strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ yourself. Let them see that exhibited in you. Because you, above all other people in the world, are going to be able to reach them more quickly and more thoroughly than anybody else. There was a young man many, many, many years ago named Chateaubriand. And Chateaubriand abandoned his Christian faith as a young man. And he wrote books condemning Christianity. Severely condemning Christianity. And this broke his godly mother's heart. And for years, Chateaubriand's mother prayed for him. And then on... May the 31st, 1798, Chateaubriand was delivered a letter from his sister whose name was Apolline. And Apolline brought a letter to Chateaubriand saying that his mother had died. Well, that broke his heart. And in this letter, uh, mom wrote it before she passed away. She told her son, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you will return to your faith, return to the Lord. And it, w- it was a letter of that flavor. Well, shortly after receiving this letter, um, his sister died. And that was more than Chateaubriand could bear. And he gave his heart to the Lord at that point. And he asked God to forgive him. And he surrendered his heart and his pen to Jesus Christ. He would later write in a book, I wept and I believed. And he would go on to write one of the most famous books in Christianity called The Genius of Christianity. And it was all because a godly mother prayed for a wayward child. Now, she never lived to see the end result of her prayer life. But it happened anyway. A broken faith and a broken heart. We, we live in a world that does not care whether your children follow Christ or not. As a matter of fact, uh, they don't want them to. And if we don't teach our children to follow Christ, the world will teach them not to. Because the world hates what we stand for. The world hates what we believe. The world despises the fact that we believe there is a God. There is a meta-narrative. There is a purpose for life. We're not just organisms. We're not just um, uh, non-persons that, uh, that absorb the flavors of a culture and that develops us into what we are. We're more than that. We're more than really clever animals. We're more than really ingenious forms of life that have, have no connection to anything other than the material world. We're much more than that. We're the very offspring of God, the Bible says. God is the one that spoke into existence all things. And he spoke into existence Adam. And from Adam, he formed the first individual that would become a mother. And that was Eve. Now, in in life, I'm aware of the, the devastating impact that culture can have on our kids. And it breaks my heart to see you watch the evening news and you see uh, these 18, 19, and 20-year-olds that are living just absolutely wildly outside the boundaries of God's will for their lives. Matter of fact, those of you who are of this generation, the generation of Woodstock, How many of you remember Woodstock? It was, in my opinion, one of the turning points in American history. It was was a weak end of absolute unrestrained immorality. And that generation found out, ah, we can do this and it's okay. And so they sort of threw off all constraint. They threw off all boundaries of morality. And that's what that weekend was all about. Well, they rented a piece of property from a farmer up there in the northeast part of the country. 
and they were told that there would be about uh, 15,000 people there. It turned out there were 250,000 people there. All right, now those, those kids that were at Woodstock would be about my age right now. They had children. All right, and then those children have had children. Now what happened when, when people who throw off all constraints of morality, what happens when they raise a child in that atmosphere? All right, now take it one more generation. And even fewer moral restraints are in place with that second generation. That's what we're dealing with right now. That's the generation that is screaming that we want no restraints on what we do. We want no restraints on our sexual appetites or our moral appetites. And, and we, want, we want everything given to us by government decree. That's where we are. Decisions create events. Now here's this woman. This very great, wealthy, prominent woman. Didn't need anything. Didn't want to meet the king. Didn't want to meet the, the captain of the host. None of that was important to her. But in her heart, she wanted a child. But she wouldn't say that. And Gehazi noticed that there was no nursery in the, in the house. And that was the thing that she wanted more than anything, but she never mentioned it. And then when Elisha says to her, you'll have a baby this time next year. Now, her husband is old. And she's like, oh, look, man. <laughs> Don't be monkeying with me about a child. He said, no, I'm telling you the truth. And it did happen. But then the child died. And she got angry. And she went to his house and said, I told you. Do you remember? Did I ask you for a baby? I did not. Did I ask you for this grief? I did not. I even told you that day, don't monkey with me about this. So I had a child, and now that child is laying on your bed, graveyard dead. Just sort of a rubbing it in. Well, the Lord was about to step in and do something again. Elisha goes down to the house after Gehazi's failed attempt, lays down on the child, and the life is returned to the child, and the child is returned to the mother. Now, that doesn't happen today. I won't tell you, you kids, those of you that still are at home, as children, love your mother. There are going to be times when she's going to spank your rear end. Love your mother. I remember my mom and dad telling me, this hurts me more than it hurts you. I never believed it. Anybody in here ever believe that? I never believed it. My dad would grab me by the hand, he'd run me in a circle. I'd run him in a circle. And he was young enough then, that he, could, he could follow me. But man, about every, about every second step, pow, 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 pow. This hurts me more than I was like, yeah, right. Well, I found out later, I know exactly what he's talking about. Love your mother. Honor your mother. This is how you learn how to honor a wife, by the way, is honoring your mom. And so you, you young men that still have a mother, those of us that uh, are in this auditorium, as a matter of fact, your mom's still alive. Thank God for that blessing. And if she has raised you on your knees, if she has raised you to honor God, if she has raised you by reading the Bible in your hearing, even before you were born while you were in your mother's womb, I've known of mothers to read the Bible to their unborn child and to play music that honors God to their unborn child. Give them every possible advantage you can and so thank you moms that have, you've raised your kids in church chances are those of you who are adults in here today you are in here today because of the influence of your mother chances are now 
we're, we're on the stage now of life. We have an opportunity to influence not only children, but now many of us have grandchildren. Now, I don't have any disciplinary authority over my grandchildren. I can have influence in their lives. And so, moms, first of all, thank you. And we're going to give you a gift here in just a moment to let you know that what you have done through the years has not gone unnoticed. I read one time that a mother is one who, upon having five guests and noticing they're just four pieces of pie, promptly announces she never did care for pie. I know of some of the sacrifices that some of you ladies have made, other sacrifices I'm unaware of and should be. So today, we salute you. Thank you. It wasn't the man that entered the jaws of death to bring life into the world. That wasn't us. We, we, we don't know anything about that. Somebody said that the closest thing a man will ever come to the pain of childbirth is to step on an upturned electrical plug in the middle of the night. Uh, and I've, I've done that, but I still don't think that even comes close to what you ladies went through. And, and, but do you remember... You remember those hours of labor and the pain and, and, and you know, back, they, they've got the monitor that shows you now and uh, there's one coming and the husband says, you know, there's one coming. You know, ladies can lose all discretion when they're in labor. This is your fault. You know, I'm, I'm so, but I, I, can, I can understand that. But, you know, for nine months, really, what did that baby do for you for nine months? Made you sick, right? We've got some, I've known women that, that were sick from day one. For nine months, they puked every day. That's miserable. I've never done that in my life. You, I mean, you, you feel awkward. You feel like, you know, I, I've seen ladies that were so big, oh, my word. You know, I, I mean, they could open a, a twirling door, you know, those revolving doors. Just by, you know, It's just like, wow. And it's, you can't sit down because you're miserable and you can't stand up because you're, you can't lay down you can't lay on your stomach you know you're just kind of losing balance and what has that baby done for you and then the day that child is born oh my word you remember ladies the first time you ever saw your first child the first child did your heart get stolen Linda immediately Brenna was your heart stolen there's not a mother in here that wouldn't say, oh, my goodness. And it's not just the first one. There's just, and I understand that. But your heart was stolen. Even though that child has done nothing for nine months, but probably create misery. Now, now, the greatest transfer of love that you will ever experience. And so, moms, we thank you. I want to thank you for that. I'm grateful for your ministry in the lives of your children. And I think today is a good day for us to thank our moms. And so if your mom is still alive, what an opportunity. A good day to say, Mom, thank you. I, I, I've not always agreed with everything you've done, and, and I've, I've been angry at you at times. I ask you to forgive me for that, but I just want you to know that I love you. Good day to do that. We have a gift for all of our ladies. And here's what we're going to do. 